today I'm foraging some elderberries. These guys are ripe now in the late summer and mm, they're pretty good. So elderberry is pretty well known among modern foragers and uh, it's historically also very popular among many different uh, native tribes. But uh, this is that's not really one of my big favorites. It's pretty good. The berries are consistently good. Uh, it's a little, they're a little small. But I also feel like I can't get a ton because they kind of have a, a spotty distribution. So there's like elderberry all over, all around this one particular spot. But uh, in general, in my area, they're kind of, uh, you only find one or two plants at a time, usually by the stream or water, but they just happen to be growing in a nice thicket here. So there's a few different species of elderberry. Anyway, for all uses, they're essentially the same. They're a pretty popular food source wherever they occur. among natives and modern foragers. Uh, they're also very popular medicinally. Ooh, look at this bunch. See, the way I prefer to gather them is to cut off the whole umbel. This little cluster is called an umbel in botanical terms. And just sort of let it drop into my net or basket. And then what I'll do is I'll dry these and then shake them around. And all of the berries will fall off of these stems. And uh, you can also kind of squish them up. The really smallest one tends to get fall off too, but you can winnow those off. So I blow a little fan over them and toss them in the air. So it's a pretty, pretty easy to process. And uh, there's some, some people out there saying that you shouldn't eat uh, elderberry raw. It's the safest advice, but it's also not super uh, realistic. I mean, uh, I've eaten a ton of raw elderberries, and I'm fine, I think. <laughs> but uh, no, I actually did the research, and so all parts of the elderberry plant contain plenty of cyanogenic glycosides, which are uh, compounds that turn into cyanide in your body. And uh, of all parts of the plant, the fruits, the ripe fruits, have the least. And I did the calculations, looked at the LD50, uh, that's the lethal, median lethal dose. You would essentially need to eat multiple times your body weight and the ripe fruits to reach that median lethal dose. I wouldn't eat the green fruits though. Those have plenty of cyanide and Definitely not the other plant parts, although they were used medicinally by some, by some, uh, some native groups. In the, I know in California, some Round Valley tribes would use, I believe it was the bark and the roots of elderberry to uh, treat really severe cases. Uh, it's definitely considered like a last resort medicine, probably because it's so toxic. But uh, I think for, it's like a laxative or an emetic, so it'll make you barf. Ow, it just kind of whacked in the eye. Elderberry is well known for its medicinal uses as well, uh, especially the flowers. So elder flowers they occur in these same umbels. So it looks kind of just like this, but instead of each of those fruits, there's a white uh, flower, small white flower. And those are really popular among natives historically for treating fever. A lot of different native groups use it independently for treating fever, but also used for a variety of ailments like cough, cold, uh, flu, uh, headache. So uh, one way to gather those is Kind of the same way I'm gathering the fruits here, which is to snip off a whole 
umbel and then put that in a bag, a paper bag or something. Allow it to dry and then shake the bag. And basically just the flowers are gonna fall off and you can make a nice tea or decoction out of that. Use it for fever or whatever ailment. But I, I use the fruits as well when, I, when I'm sick with this flu kind of thing. I'll make a tea out of the fruits. So the way I normally prepare them is to dry them. Drying, by the way, gets rid of those cyanide compounds. So the, the ripe fruits are fine to eat as long as they're dried or cooked. I think generally you'll be okay if you eat a reasonable amount of the fresh raw fruits. That's all I can think of right now for the medicinal and edible uses. But there's some cool material uses of elderberry as well. Uh, so the number one thing is just the, the way the wood is. That sounds silly to say it like that. Okay, so this is a dead piece. And it's pretty soft. Okay, first of all, you can see it's quite straight. So that lends itself to making arrows, but even more so, it's uh, very light. You can probably hear how light it is, but you can see I break it, which is very easy to do. Its core has got this just pith, it's like very low density. And this was used historically for tinder by uh, certain tribes. I can't remember which, but um, so it makes it so light, very low density pith. So it was used for arrows, although I've made a few arrows out of it. I'm not a, too partial for using it for arrows because a lot of times you can't really find one that's actually real straight. It's just really close and you would think that it'd be pretty easy to straighten, but because of its uh, construction, which you can see right there is you know, a thin wood, outer part of wood and a very light pith, uh, it, it makes it really hard to straighten. So normal straightening methods is just heating it up over a fire and bending it don't really work that well on it. So I'm not too partial to it for arrows. But I'll tell you what, it makes some excellent flutes and pipes. So it's uh, something useful in nature. It's a nice tube. Um, it's kind of a pain to hollow out a, uh, a long wood section without, you know, like uh, metal tools, something like a, a wire, or a long file or drill. So the answer is just to find naturally occurring stuff where it's easy to remove the center and the pith of the elderberry couldn't be easier to remove. So I've made a number of flutes and pipes out of elderberry stems and uh, they look good. This, they sound good in the flights and they, or the flutes and the, uh, they smoke good for the pipes too. Although I definitely wouldn't like use green wood for either of those things going in your mouth. Uh, but they were, they were used by some, some Round Valley tribes for things like clapper sticks, a clapper instrument. It's easy to just split the stick and you have two sides and clap them together. But also little containers. Uh, I think it was some Great Basin tribe that would make little tubes of elderberry wood and use those to store grasshoppers. So grasshoppers were popular, especially among uh, some Great Basin tribes like the Shoshone or Paiute. Uh, and uh, to store them, they would make these little tubes out of elderberry wood hollowed out. And you have a little stopper cork-like thing at the end. 
and you mash those full of the preserved uh, grasshoppers or crickets, Mormon crickets, for example, those big, scary looking ones. Uh, I probably have plenty for now. I could gather a lot more from this area. I suppose they are pretty easy to gather given that um, they're in these nice big clusters of a ton. Just drop the whole ripe cluster into your bag. They're small. Uh, I do, it is one of my go-to things to forge though, so I recommend giving that a try if you wanna forge something. Look at the size of this cluster. That was all together. But I'll leave the rest for the birds. Could use some more elderberry spread around town. No, I'm lost in this bush. I'll make my way through. And I know that I might grab some pieces of wood on the way out to make a uh, some more flutes. Those are always a fun project. And this is how to ID elderberry. It's a good one to be a little bit more careful on because a lot of the characteristics can be superficially similar to the APACA or the parsley family, which includes things like uh, poison hemlock or uh, water hemlock, which are probably some of those toxic species in North America. And those characteristics they have in common are the umble fruit and flower heads. So the umble just think umbrella, they kind of form this big umbrella-like structure with those uh, stems in a sort of fractal orientation. They're all kind of in one plane that's just wrapped around. So the flowers are like this, but uh, just they're small white flowers. And the sort of ribbing along the stems is also kind of characteristics of the uh, APACA. This actually isn't in the APACA, it's in the um, Adoxaceae or the muskroot family. Uh, but it does have these humble flower heads. And those ridges along the stems are only more just like on the, uh, the leaves themselves, like this petiole. Like this petiole or uh, along the flower clusters of these umbels. But another thing that is kind of parsley-like is the leaf structure. So they have compound leaves, um, let's say about seven leaflets normally, but it can vary. But uh, these have opposite orientation. So these petioles are opposite one another. Uh, another identifying characteristic are these lenticels. So these little dots, bumps all along the stem, especially the more woody parts. Those are lenticels, it's a breathing mechanism of the plant and the elderberry definitely has uh, marked large lenticels. The pith or that uh, soft, woody center, soft center of the stems is a characteristic of the elderberry and it forms these uh, petiole scars and it's opposite so in the stems you'll see something like this. It's a pretty distinct structure. You can see it on that intact leaf there. And uh, each of these has like a little node, kind of like a bamboo. <clears throat> what else? It has these kind of teeth, jagged leaf margins. Um, and you often find it in wet areas or near streams or water, not like in water, but nearby. So this would be Sambucus candidensis, but those characteristics all kind of describe different elderberry species. Um, 
the one that we have here in Central Texas is pretty small and scrubby. You can see behind me all of those are elderberries. But uh, when I live in California, there's a blue elderberry there, and those are, get to be big trees, like full-size trees. Um, and those can be used in all the same way. But red elderberries, similarly shrubby, like this. So it's a beautiful plant, one of my favorites, tons of uses. Uh, keep an eye out for it. So I wanted to break down the official taxonomy of elderberries in the U.S. with my notes in front of me because I just figured this out. It's extremely confusing and it, even uh, many modern plant databases such as the USDA plants database have errors in their current classification and naming of different elderberry species. So in the U.S. there are four elderberry species. Sambucus canadensis, Sambucus cerulea, Sambucus nigra, and Sambucus racemosa. Only two of those are in Texas, Sambucus canadensis and Sambucus cerulea. Sambucus nigra is native to Europe, and it's been introduced to parts of the northeastern U.S. Sambucus racemosa is native to both the U.S. and Europe, but does not occur wild in Texas, being mainly found in the Rocky Mountains and westward, the Northern Appalachians, and the Great Lakes. Sambucus canadensis is native to most of North America, but does not occur in the Great Basin or Pacific Northwest, so that includes the states of Utah, Nevada, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Sambucus cerulea is only in West Texas in the Big Bend area, and is found in all westward states of Texas, uh, especially in the Great Basin and Pacific Northwest, so it kind of replaces Sambucus canadensis in the Great Basin and Pacific Northwest. And these uh, specific epithets, so like Cerulea, Nigra, Rasmosa, are they're often given as variety or subspecies of one another, so you might have Sambucus nigra, subspecies Cerulea, which is a synonym of Sambucus Cerulea. So that's why it's very confusing and a lot of sources have it mixed up, but that is the current official breakdown of elderberry taxonomy in the U.S.